Mocking cast, mocking cast listeners. The mocking cast is an audio dimensional capsule of one Mockingbird Ministries. I am Talstar, your navigator. This transmission is time nebulized for communication purposes and is compatible with a paper fiber artifact from Earth Year 2020 named The Future Issue. It is transmitted long after the unfortunate Earth departure of that artifact's editor, Ethan Richardson. Copies of this manuscript are known to still be available, though highly treasured. It must be said, this audio dimensional capsule you are about to hear can only provide a small sample of the illumination it contains but it too carries a pivotal message one that has been more or less confirmed in new earth year 3095 the message is this grace endures do not fear grace endures do not fear Grace endures. This is Ethan Richardson. The science fiction writer Ted Chang has this really amazing, very short story in his collection called Exhalation. The story itself is called What's Expected of Us. And in the story, which actually reads more like a journalist report in like a science magazine, the narrator is describing this new consumer product, not dissimilar from what we would think of as like a fidget spinner that has taken the world by storm. It's called a predictor. And it's this small electronic device about the size of a car remote. And the device is really simple. On it, you have a button and you have a green light. And normally, as these things go, you would think that if you press the button, the light turns on, like a flashlight or a laser pointer. The predictor works backwards. The light will flash green exactly one second before your finger presses the button. No matter what. No matter how many ways you try, you can wait 45 seconds to press the button or 45 years the light will flash green exactly one second before your finger presses that button. So at first, you know, this new device comes out. It's all fun and games. People bring predictors to parties, show them off, try to beat the game by doing various tricks, and they laugh that nothing can break the cycle. Eventually, though, the novelty wears off, and this little miniature device has made some really serious existential points to its user, mainly You do not have free will. The narrator says this. The person may appear to lose interest in it, but no one can forget what it means. Over the following weeks, some people, realizing that their choices no longer matter, refuse to make any choices at all. Eventually, a third of those who play with the predictor may be hospitalized because they won't feed themselves. The end state is called akinetic mutism a kind of waking coma. The ability to move remains, but the motivation is gone. Before people started playing with the predictors, akinetic mutism was very rare, a result of damage to the anterior cingulate region of the brain. Now it spreads like a cognitive plague. People used to speculate about a thought that destroys the thinker. It turns out that the disabling thought is one that we've all encountered before. The idea that free will doesn't exist. It just wasn't harmful until you believed it. It's 
So anyways, back to the story, people go to the doctor, they feel this deep malaise, the sense that nothing matters because it's all predetermined anyways. They sit down with the doctors and they, the doctors tell their patients, listen, a month ago, it was no different. You were no more in control, but you were happy. And then the patients reply, yes, but now I know. Towards the end of the story, the writer sends a warning to his reader. This is what he says. My message to you is this. Pretend that you have free will. It's essential that you behave as if your decisions matter, even though you know that they don't. The reality isn't important. What's important is your belief. And believing the lie is the only way to avoid a waking coma. Civilization now depends on self-deception. Perhaps it always has. That's the end of the quote. I love that the one writing this warning, though, um, is giving a warning about the future being set in stone, but he's still giving a warning. I mean, the whole reason that you give someone a warning is to prepare someone for the future so that they can make a change. And this is why I love Ted Ching's storytelling so much. I mean, he's a writer who lives in the future. He's a futuristic writer. But there's a sense in his writing that no matter how much technology progresses, no matter how much time travel will change our current existence, there is still the unchangeable fact that our lives are human and that we will unchangeably long for the same things. We will hope for newness of life, but that newness will be held in the hands of a future that is ultimately not in our control. Thankfully, we believe that it is in the hands of someone else who has control, and those hands aren't sinister. This, to me, stands in high contrast with the insane optimism of the 21st century, especially the optimism of every election season, where everyone has a promise to sell, and the future is always brighter than the present. And don't get me wrong, I don't think Ted Chang is writing science fiction with a Christian lens in mind. But I do think that the predictor is a great starting point for us to introduce the mixed bag that comes with talking about the future as Christians. Even within a Christian framework, the future carries more than just a little ambivalence. I mean, obviously there's hope. Christianity is based in future hope. You know, we're invited to view our lives and all of creation as wrapped up in the promise of resurrection, the promise of redemption, reconciliation, renewal. But still, even with the promise of all these re's, you know, there's a total wariness about our own future forward projects. I mean, just listen to Jesus. He talks specifically about not worrying about tomorrow, you know, not storing up your warehouses for the future. Don't think about these things, he says, because your life today is where I am. And who knows how many days you have left after that. Don't think that any of your plans can save you. And so we realized as we were putting this issue together, that the real distinction is not whether Christianity is future positive or future negative, whether we're utopian or dystopian folks but in whose hands the future relies. And as far as the Bible is concerned, it does not rely on you or me. You know, the Christian is not surprised to dystopian thinking because, frankly, we see everywhere, um, not just in the Bible, but in our own lives, that in our hands, the world would spin out of control. Even though, you know, ultimately, we view all of it in light of a Savior, who came and who will come again and who will wipe the tears away. So anyways, this podcast is really just a taste of the ground that we've covered in this issue, the future. For the next hour, let's explore what the future holds. And to do that first, we have to travel backwards. We're going to talk with the historian Tom Holland. DZ is going to interview him to talk about the Christian mark on history and its current and future mark on the secular age that we currently live in. Then I chat with uh, New York Times journalist and Silicon Valley insider Nellie Bowles, and she talks to us about 
West Coast identity crises and what it's like to chase righteousness without the roots of religion. And then finally, I sit down with my old friend and former colleague, Will McDavid, who's now a lawyer, but still the master when it comes to conversations about the apocalypse. That's it for now. As you know, the future, like anything else, can be ordered online. You can just order a subscription there for your future girlfriend or just your future self, magazine.embird.com. Okay, let the speculative conversations begin. Thanks for listening. Thank you again for, for joining us today on The Mockingcast. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, for those who are unfamiliar with the book, tell us a little bit about its genesis. Right. Well, it's a product not just of the course of my writing career, which has been focused on on ancient history and, and early medieval history, um, but actually reaches right the way back into my childhood, because the book in many ways is, is a reflection of what it is that has, has shaped me personally, but also the, the culture of the West in which um, I've grown up in. Mm. Um, as a child, I was raised a Christian. My mother um, is a devout member of the Church of England. So I, I went to church, I sang in the choir, I went to Sunday school. But I was less interested in Christianity. I was less interested in the Christian God. I was less interested in the figure even of Jesus than I was in the Greek gods, which mm. essentially I found a lot more kind of, well, sexy, I suppose, a lot more charismatic and exciting. And my love for the Greek gods was combined with a kind of childish admiration for the glamour and swagger of the ancient empires, and I suppose the Romans in particular. So if you'd asked me as a child, whose side do you want, Pontius Pilate's or Jesus's, I would have completely been on the side of Pontius Pilate. Mm. He had the purple, he had the eagles, he had all the glamour. <laughs> um, and it's not as though I kind of lost my faith in a reverse Damascene conversion or anything like that. It was as though it was kind of gradually blotted out by the blaze of my fascination with Greece and Rome in particular. And so when I came to write history, as novelists draw often on their, their childhoods, I, writing nonfiction, also did the same. And I wrote about Rome and I wrote about Greece and I, I wrote about Persia. But particularly writing about Rome, I... And the process of trying to get inside the heads of the Romans, also to write about them, to, to, to use English, a language very remote from Latin in many ways. I found the effort of trying to get inside the Roman heads hugely challenging. And I found the effort of trying to write about them hugely challenging as well, because I increasingly felt that words that I was using, like religion or secular or things like that, just didn't measure up to how the, how the Romans seemed to me to function, how they see, saw the world. And, and right. so I found it, the more I studied them, the more I, you might think I, I, I became familiar with the Romans, the more unfamiliar they came to seem, the more disorienting, the more unsettling, the more frightening. And so obviously I then increasingly <laughs> began to ask myself, well, you know, what changed and what is the measure of change and what is the scale of the change? And the more I asked that question, the more I began to focus on on, on what particularly could have, have precipitated the change between the world of 2000 years ago and the world in which I was living. And I increasingly came to the conclusion that it was centred on Christianity and the great revolution, the transformation, the upheaval in almost every aspect of what makes the West the West. And so Dominion is really an attempt, I suppose, not just to trace the, the, the course of you know, this great revolutionary moment, as I see it, and the, the way that it's reverberated through the millennium that have followed, mm -hmm. but also, you know, whether I was right. So it, it was a book that was kind of both exciting, slightly nerve wracking for me to write, because right the way up to the end, I wasn't entirely sure that I would that I would prove that my thesis was correct i'm relieved to tell you to tell your listeners that actually i i was completely right i'm not, maybe <laughs> not completely right. but 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 i'm i'm pretty happy that that ha starting in in um uh, 479 bc and ending with the trump presidency i'm 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 pretty confident that, that there are threads there that i i i, I see 
need Foley. I think you're very, very successful at it. I mean, it's, it is a massively ambitious project that you undertook. Um, I'm wondering, what did you leave on the cutting room floor? Well, there was so much. And I should, I, I mean, a couple of things I should emphasize. The first is that this isn't a history of Christianity per se. So it's not a history of every synod or pope. It's also not a history of the entire span of global Christianity. So the Eastern churches and, and the Orthodox church are left out because I'm specifically interested in what it is that's been particularly revolutionary and particularly transformative. And so although clearly the primal um, appearance of Christianity is the great revolution, I think that it takes a particular course in Latin Christendom, in what becomes the West. And it does so really, I think, in the 11th century. So that is the thread that I'm following in particular. It's, it's not that I'm not interested in, in the Orthodox Church. I am, and I've written about it before. But I think the, um, the way that, that Christianity, if you like, evolves, and one might even say mutates, to create the notions like the secular or homosexuality or human rights, concepts that to many people today, I think, are just taken for granted, but seem to me deeply rooted in the specific theology and history of the Latin church. Um, the other thing I should say about the way that I structured the book was I, even with that manifesto, I realised that there was just too much to uh, to handle. So I had to break it down. And I um, I kind of looked like, I guess, an inspiration with the, with the parables told by Jesus, the way in which stories can pack an incredible punch. And I suppose mm. one of the themes of the book is that one of the ways in which Christianity has influenced us is through narrative as much as through doctrine. It's stories like the Good Samaritan have had, you know, I mean, they, they, they have a, a, an immeasurable impact, far greater perhaps than just a list of do's and don'ts. And so the way that I structured the book was I divided into three parts. I uh, divided each part into seven chapters. I divided each chapter into three parts. So it's a kind of interplay between the Christian sacred numbers of, of three and seven. Um, and each chapter has a single word title and begins with a particular moment in time that I hope tells a story that then enables us to kind of expand outwards and look at the theme that's being developed. So, for instance, the opening chapter begins with the crucifixion of a Persian governor on the shores of the Hellespont in 479 BC. That chapter is called Athens, and it looks at the influence of Greece. And then we end with a chapter called Woke, which opens with Angela Merkel on TV with a, a Palestinian girl who's come over from the occupied territories to receive medical treatment and now has to go back home. She's at school where Merkel is giving a live televised conference and she breaks down in tears live on TV. Um, and from that, we we go outwards to look at the uh, the issue of, of refugees in the modern West. We look at the Harvey Weinstein scandal and then I turn it back and sum up at the end. In selecting those individual those vignettes that are so effective, I'm sure there are many that that you you could just write a whole book of just those vignettes, which would be very powerful. In its well, there was so, there were so many where I, I I thought I could write a book about this. I could cheerfully dwell on on this for several years. One in particular, I mean, almost all of them I, I had in my mind before I began it, kind of sloshing around in among the ganglion. But there was one chapter set in the 14th century, and it's called Flesh, and it's about Christian attitudes to sex, to male and female, to marriage, to same-sex relations. And I was thinking, should I, should I begin with Catherine of Siena? She's, she, she is in the chapter. And then I came across this throwaway line about a group of nuns who'd been burnt by inquisitors because they thought that the Holy Spirit had become incarnate of a woman. <laughs> yeah. I'd never heard of that. I, I like, wow, that sounds good. And I went and read it up and it's the most extraordinary story. I mean, it's like something out of Umberto Eco. It's like, I mean, you, you, you would, I'm sure Umberto Eco must have written about it. Set in Milan about a, a bohemian noble woman who claimed to have been the, or is thought to have been the Holy Spirit um, and uh, a, a, a female cousin of the um, the tyrant of, of Milan who has ambitions to become the Pope. I mean, it's an amazing story. You also have fun with the Marquis de Sade. It, I, I thought that section was convincing. 
one of the great arguments of the book is that secularism is not an emancipation from Christian theology, but in fact is almost its its uh, its, its fruition. It. It's yeah. it's entrenched in it. You received a little bit of criticism on that, but I also think it's it seems to be pretty self evident based on if people have actually read the book. Do you feel any differently now than you did after the book was published? Is that that has it been borne out in the response yeah. even? Yeah, I think so. I, b- b- because, uh, I mean, just to very quickly sketch out the, the, the argument, the, the idea, the word secular and the concept of it uh, ultimately derives from uh, Augustine's use of, of the Latin word seculum, which means basically the kind of the flux, the span of, of, of human existence and therefore the way in which things are dissolved upon time. And, and against that, he, he counterpoints the, the, the radiant eternity of the city of God, to which fallen humanity can have a religio, a binding, um, by virtue of the church. And over the course of the centuries, this kind of emerges a very, very strange and distinctive way of seeing the world that it can be divided up into things called religion, which exist separately from something which is called the secular. And it's something that, as a concept, is in, entirely exclusive to uh, Western Christendom and, and what emerges to become the West, and then gets exported by the West in its imperial heyday and then its ideological heyday in the 20th century around the world, to the degree that you now have Turkey is a, a avowedly a secular republic, India is a secular republic, um, Japan is secular. And in the West, in multicultural and multi-faith societies, it's very important for the successful functioning of that concept, the idea that there is something called the secular space, something that can be seen as neutral, that can kind of play referee between all the the, the, the competing religions, as they're called, that this is taken for granted, that it's not seen as being something contingent, not seen as being something that is the fruit of a, a distinctively Christian evolution. And so you can see why there is some kickback against the idea that it actually it's not remotely neutral, that it's mm. it's entirely bred of Christian ideas. Because if you do that, then to a degree, you you undermine the, the, the core conceit of secularism as it functions today. And I think that that a lot of what is happening, say, in India, say, in Turkey, is a kind of maybe I don't know I mean, whether Modi or, or Erdogan recognize this openly, I'm not sure, but a kind of inchoate feeling that actually secularism is not neutral, that it is something that in a way has been imposed on the very different traditions of respectively um, Hindu India and Muslim Turkey. I understand why there would be kickback on the idea that the secular isn't a neutral concept, but it, it really doesn't seem to me to be neutral. And I suppose the core argument of Dominion is that there's so many aspects of what derives from Christianity that are similar, that we are, one metaphor, the obvious one is that the West is a goldfish bowl and that we are goldfish swimming in Christian waters. And another one that struck me after I'd finished the book, when I watched the drama series about Chernobyl. Oh, yes. And there's a sequence where two of the main characters are right in the heart of the reactor. You can literally see the radiation leaking out because it's ionizing the air. But of course, the impact of that leak is there in the air above Ukrainian forests and Scandinavian seas and Cumbrian uplands. You don't see it, but you're breathing it in. Um, I, I'm not saying that Christianity is like radioactivity. It doesn't make you, it doesn't kill you, make <laughs> your hair fall out. But, 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 but its impact often is experienced by people who are being affected by it and changed by it, but don't recognize it. That's interesting. I mean, it, it, it dovetails with one, something you wrote in response to our questions in the magazine. When you say that Christianity has come to live in the shadow of its own hegemony, uh, its cultural power can easily become a source of discomfort to those who contemplate Christ's death as a slave on the cross. In a maneuver that would certainly have prompted mocking laughter from Nietzsche, it has sought to emulate Christ's sacrifice on the cross by sacrificing its own claim to embody the way, the truth, the life. Um, I'm thinking of radiation and sort of the half-life of something. Yeah, that would... you know, that's one of the, the great paradoxes, the hostility that is often manifest among highly educated liberals towards Christianity does seem to me to be bred of highly Christian motivations. It's, it's, it's bred of a suspicion of the very cultural power that Christianity exerts, not just in the West, but across the world, and uh, of which their own qualms are a, a, an expression. 
Mm. And I, 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 but I imagine, of course, highly educated, sophisticated <laughs> people don't like being told that that's what they're actually acting out of a, a sort of a latent sense of Christian morality. Well, yeah, maybe, but maybe not. I mean, it's been my own journey of discovery, really. I suppose, mm. kind of realising what, what are the wellsprings of what I think, of what I feel? Why do I take things for granted in the way that I do? And once I began questioning pretty much everything I thought and looking at them not in abstract philosophical terms, but as products of history, almost invariably, it would, it would take me back to tiny Christian acorns. And like it's not, actually, many of those acorns are scattered in that incredibly fertile seedbed that are the letters of Paul. Mm. Well, that's that's interesting because Paul, you know, is in the academy has had a, been a uh, there's he's been experienced a little bit of a um, turbulence. Impo- impoverishment, <laughs> yes, <laughs> turbulence. And, I, I mean, uh, that... I I think that that I've spent so long reading the the kind of masterpieces of of classical literature and acknowledging their greatness and their impact mm. but they are as nothing compared to paul's letters which you know are so few in number and yet almost everything that makes the west distinctive is there within their verses as i say like a kind of tiny acorns from which these enormous spreading oaks have grown and continue to grow and that's why Nietzsche hated him so much. He, what did he call him? A, a man of diabolical ambition or something like that, or great ambition? <laughs> yeah, well, well so, I, so what I wanted to do with this book was to get back to a sense of the, the shock of it, mm, the surprise yeah. of it, how strange it is, how unsettling, how bizarre. And one of the things that sharpened this for me was I made a documentary for, for British TV about the Islamic State. And part of this, as for part of the filming we went to a place called Sinjar which when we went was still right on the front line with the Islamic State they had captured it in 2014 we went there shortly after it got recaptured by the Kurds but they were still a couple of miles away across open land so with within mortar range and in Sinjar they had uh, notoriously rounded up the women of a uh, religious minority called the Yazidis who were particularly targeted because they were accused by Islamic State of of being quite falsely, of being devil worshippers. Many of the women were enslaved. Many more were killed. Their bones were left scattered over, over the fields on, in the no man's land where you could walk among them. And many of the men were crucified. And mm. to stand in this terrible place, um, knowing that the people who had done crucifixions exactly as the Romans had done with the aim of instilling terror and dread and knowing that they were within striking distance brought home to me the kind of boldness, the shocking quality of the manoeuvre perpetrated by Christians when they transformed this paradigmatic emblem of power and of imperial strength into its opposite. Mm. And so I came back from that and I rewrote the opening to Dominion to place a much greater emphasis on the horrors of crucifixion. And in a sense, the two bookends of the narrative are provided by the two people who, who I think more powerfully than anyone else bring home to us and understood the strangeness of that manoeuvre, the strangeness of making the cross into an emblem of the triumph of the weak over the strong. And the first of those was Paul and the second was Nietzsche. And both of them entirely understood the strangeness. They had of course, very different understandings of what the implications of that strangeness were. To Paul, it's euangelion, it's good news. This is, you know, this is the gospel. This is the most astonishing thing, the most wondrous thing that has ever happened. To Nietzsche, it's a catastrophe. It's the Mm. triumph of the petty, of the snivelling of the sick over those who are, are, are glorious and golden. Um, But both of them understand the primal, earth-shaking quality of what the cross represents. Wow. Well, Tom, I realize we're we're up to to time. Um, 
thank you so much. I look forward to asking you more questions. I'm, I'm dying to sort of hear more of what you're thinking about. Uh, are people returning to this, uh, to this in any sense, to the seed bed, as you call it? Of, uh, um, but what are you working on now? Is a, a, that's the final question. What's the Right. Well, the the, um, the the scope of Dominion was so huge and I had to make so many choices about what to do that I've now done. I, I've now turned to almost the opposite, which is a translation. And it's a translation of Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars, um, which will replace Robert Graves's translation for Penguin Classics. So I did it principally <laughs> because I wanted the bragging right. But it's also because, you know, with a translation, the words are already written. You're, you're mm. just kind of, you know, you're sticking to the structure. But also with Suetonius, I'm going back into the uh, the, the, the pre-Christian world and I'm, I'm inhabiting the the mindset of, of, of people who lived before Christianity triumphs. And in a way, I'm stress testing the thesis of dominion by doing that. And again, <laughs> I'm relieved to announce that it's passing the test, or at least it is so far. I'm, I'm just in the middle of writing about, of, of translating the life of Caligula. And oh my, um, oh my goodness, you know, there's, 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 there's barely a paragraph in it where I'm not going, ooh. <laughs> oh wow well i cannot wait to to get to talk more so thank you so much thanks for writing the book we've re i mean it's been really helpful my my brother was just talking to me about he, he's a, a rector of a church in uh outside new york and his they're all going to greece and turkey and the required reading has been your book oh, i'm um, so glad to hear that it's uh <laughs> so anyway you thank him i i will but thank you tom and we look forward to seeing you uh in april I think one of the things that we're always drawn to about your writing is that you're sort of covering this world where there's these like utopian visions of the future, but there's also these dismal dystopian ones. And the kind of this poetic irony that you're writing about that we have in Silicon Valley, this incessant optimism, this like demand for optimism. Um, but then there's also with that, like a crazy amount of burnout. And yeah. so one of, one of the articles that kind of, I think portrays that is the one about Silicon Valley going to therapy. And for those listeners who haven't actually read your article, could you just sort of run through it and talk about what you saw? Yeah, so I wrote a story a couple months ago uh, I, on the emergence of a bunch of new therapy startups. And I was kind of curious about why there were so many new therapy startups. Why was everyone getting into the mental health space? I mean, um, like the Calm calls itself the Nike of the mind or, you know, all of these new apps meant to help people feel better. Or there were also new um, modes of talk therapy and then startups getting into talk therapy, which anyway, it was just interesting. And I was like, what's going on? So I started to meet with founders. And I started to talk to some of them. And I started to um, go around San Francisco and go around Silicon Valley and, and meet with some of the people who were entering into this space. And um, what I found was there is a real crisis of confidence, and, and this has been written about by a bunch of people now, but over the last few years, and with that crisis of confidence, there's been a desire to tell a new Silicon Valley myth. I mean, the idea here has always been that we're making the world a better place, and so if we're not, what do we do? How do we deal with that? And so a lot of people are thinking about mental health, thinking about how to tell their life story, their life purpose, how, how to think about the work they do every day. And so, you know, the old saying of, like, people build startups for problems that they have. So people are <laughs> building startups for this problem. Yeah, I mean, um, a, lot of, a lot of the, I don't know, like, uh, the questions that you tend to focus on are questions that surround the millennial age group of which I'm a part and, um, of which I'm a part as well. Yeah. Well, we're and, aging out now, man, we're 31. We're not aging anymore. It's done. It's I done. <laughs> um, you have this article that you wrote about, uh, millennials going to nunneries <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and that was so, because one of my roommates went to a nunnery. One of my former roommates, basically two people in my group of friends 
ended up moving into convents. Um, it's a story I wrote that you're referencing about how young people in San Francisco are moving into a convent in South Bay. Um, and this is part of a broader trend around the country, and it's happening in part because there are fewer people going into the nunnery, into religious work. They're actually not technically nuns. It's not a nunnery, but it, into sisters' religious orders. So fewer people are going into them, and then also real estate prices are insane. So people are kind of drawn to, hey, what if we rent a room in one of these spaces? And a lot of the sisters' religious are excited about it because it means that there's young energy in the house. It means that they can make a little extra money by renting out some rooms that weren't being used. But, but all, it's just the emotional factor was really powerful for people. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot from that. The nun thing is interesting. I think that there is a searching that is happening as organized religion falls, mm-hmm. as religiosity in the U.S. continues its massive decline. Mm-hmm. There is a searching for something to replace it. I think right. humans have a need to connect in a sort of spiritual way of some sort, for whatever reason, it seems to be part of our DNA. Mm-hmm. And we are looking for what that's going to be. So I think you see it in some of the Silicon Valley rhetoric that feels like gospel, that feels like it's a belief system. And you yeah. see it in young people moving into convents and finding themselves <laughs> and finding purpose and joy. And yeah. I think the thread, and I want to focus on this a lot this year, the thread on people searching. Yeah. Where do you fall on sort of like the future of millennial question? Like covering like, lost kids? Or, or, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, I think some efforts are beautiful and amazing. Some efforts are wackadoodle, like, it, like anything else. There's not, I don't have a like millennials are doomed or millennials are saving the world take on this, but but there's definitely a big shift happening. And like the amount of change that will be wrought by the fact that we don't go to church or we don't go to school or we don't, that by and large, religiosity is falling. I don't think we fully understood what that's going to mean and what that's going to mean culturally and and the different things that are going to emerge as a response to that. So like, that's not, I'm not good or bad. I don't, it's just different. Like, It's like any other change, like uh, it just, you have to, new questions, like there's a phrase I keep thinking about, um, which is, um, and I'm I'm like, I stole it from someone, I'm bastardizing it every time I say it, I keep saying it, but it's that tradition is the answer to questions we've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And the idea being that when we get rid of tradition, that's fine and good, but then new questions are going to arise that you didn't even know had already been answered by that tradition. Mm. And it, you can you can stop going to church on Sunday. That's great. Go for it. But new questions are going to arise that, that for whatever reason, church on Sunday was invented to, to, to answer. Um, I think that this well, I mean, my personal life this is so off topic, but like I'm gay and I'm thinking about one day having kids and I'm like, oh, my God, it's so complicated. There's so many things. Like, do I burn brain? Or do I get an unknown donor? Do I get a known donor? Do I, what do I do? And it's, it's funny because it's like all these new questions that there aren't traditions to answer. Like, because I'm, I'm already like, my life is fucking the tradition. And so it's mm. like, oh, shit. Now I've got like a lot of new questions to answer. Right. Yeah, it is so interesting to see that, like, in your coverage of a world that is so, like, future-oriented and so, like, focused on who we're going to be and sort of paving this new way that it's like the questions have changed. Like, the questions of, of our lives have been the same for eons, you know, and mm-hmm. so discarding um, a whole a whole platform of, of answers can be problematic. Yeah, and, I mean, this this comes up now with technology all the time. Obviously, like, we are reckoning with how to wrap our lives around a radically new instrument. And we're not going to get rid of this instrument, but, like, it's upending long traditions. And so there are new questions, and there's going to be a lot of wrestling, I think, for a couple generations of figuring out how to deal with omnipresence connection, screen, omnipresence, being online, 
like I don't think we're gonna like figure this out in my lifetime, but I, I think so like I did a story about dopamine fasting. I think a group of kids in Silicon Valley are trying to avoid stimulation for twenty four hours. They're calling it dopamine fasting, basically like avoiding pleasure. Basically like a Vipassana meditation, like a, a meditation for a day, but also fasting. So you don't eat you, you just try to limit any pleasure. You definitely don't look at screens, you don't like turn on bright lights, you don't and mm-hmm. on the one hand, it's so silly and funny and I wrote like a story that was meant to be like lighthearted. You know, these kids are like trying to avoid all stimulation, but they're also sort of like walking around in the world and trying to like avoid eye contact too long because that makes their dopamine sword. You know, there's tons in here that's funny. Um, um, on the other hand, like with that humor and funniness, there's also something really serious that they're trying to grapple with, which yeah. is like we have at our fingertips so much pleasure available, so much mm-hmm. novelty. And I mean pleasure, like not like sex pleasure, although that too, but I mean pleasure of like stimulation, novelty, information, mm-hmm. um, just stuff to like scratch our little heads. Yeah. And these kids are trying to grapple with that and trying to figure out a way to like, we did yeah. evolve with this much stimulation all the time and this much pleasure all the time. Yeah. We evolved actually with quite a bit of pain, quite a bit of boredom. Yeah. I don't have anymore. I'm never bored anymore. And I certainly never feel pain. Right. Do you have like control gauges in, in place for, <laughs> for dealing with, um, I mean, the world that you cover and, I mean, you're also just... Like, what do I do to stay off tack and stuff like that? Yeah, or or do you... I do all sorts of things, but none of it really works. Like, it's kind of, I, it's like, sort of like crash diets. Like, yeah. one month, I'm like, I'm only eating oatmeal, and the next month, I'm like, I'm only eating pineapples. And <laughs> so that's like my equivalent, is, but that might be taken with screens. So, no, I yeah. turn them all grayscale, still grayscale. doesn't really stop me after I get used to it. A very hard thing was just literally sleeping with my phone not on a red pillow which is so sad, but really true. And um, I would be lying if I said any of it worked. Do you just get depressed thinking about, um, like, where we're headed as, as a human race? <laughs> or, or or do you, I mean, do you find in, in your uh, stories and in the people that you, you meet, um, do, you, do you feel hopeful? I don't know. I feel like I should kind of lie in this one, but... No, I mean, I'm not, like, a particularly optimistic person. Like, I think, I don't know, come on, like, you, climate change is the apocalypse on the horizon, right? Like, and I kind of believe it, and, like, we're, we're all just going to be, like, scratching each other to stay on the ice floe. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. like, but I think that we can, like, be good and enjoy and be kind to each other. And, like, make our lives a little bit better until the apocalypse. Like, there's no reason not to. I'm not wildly optimistic about the future. But, like, again, like I said, I want to help kids. I want to – you have to just, like, keep on marching on and trying to make it better. But am I, like – do I define that as optimism? Yeah. I would say that I think that we should just do the best we can while we're all here. I am optimistic about some of the interesting responses to tech and responses to falling religiosity. Like, I am interested in – and optimistic about what those mean. Like, I, I'm optimistic about dopamine fasting and mm-hmm. the idea of people, like, carving out life in overstimulation. I get excited when I see, like, you know, groups of young engineers who are doing activism and, like, using their power within their companies. That That is pretty cool to me. My colleague, Kate Conger, does an amazing job covering that. I think some of those... Do you miss having a job where you can, like, talk about the end of the world? Yeah. No, I, I definitely do miss it. I miss the exploratory part of it. You know, on the wall, it's like there's an answer, and we're trying to find it. And really, there's, like, one right way to do things. I love the exploration component of theology in general that a lot of times you're thinking about, you know, you're kind of within the guidelines set by Orthodox Christianity, you're thinking about like the possibilities and interesting kind of new paradigms. I miss that a lot. Yeah, I was thinking the other day, like one of the things that 
we could have added to as like one of the fruits of the gospel in that discussion at the back of the book is the idea of curiosity. When we were thinking about the future issue, I knew that like we sort of needed to talk about the apocalypse and and I remember having like conversations with you about sort of apocalyptic stuff in Flannery O'Connor and and we both like read like the left behind books. <laughs> but yeah, I mean it's it's kind of a it's kind of a scary topic and one in which like at least in terms of like sort of the public view of what these kinds of words mean, like apocalypse, rapture, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding. And so I immediately thought like, well, we need to we need to pull out Will's old talk from the conference because that was a whole new meaning of apocalypse. And um, but anyways, first off, I wanted to I wanted just to get your thoughts on um, left behind, because I mean, what do you think it was that made it like such an over the top success that series? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I think one thing was, just the uh, dispensationalism, you know, just being the idea that there's this end time script that's divided into certain phases and looking at Revelation very literally, trying to kind of calculate it all out. Dispensationalism had been around for a while, but I think it was kind of an esoteric thing. Like you might go hear the really quirky, like smart old guy at your church give an eight-week series on how Daniel corresponds to the timeline and and Revelation corresponds to the events in the Middle East or something. Um, But I don't think that it would have had the same sort of imaginative urgency. I think one of the really cool things about the book of Revelation and Daniel is the just crazy visual imagery of it and these incredibly striking and imaginative images and that was one of the key things about revelation that i think left behind really captures is Hmm. that it's not an academic exercise of calculating you know which days are going to be when and how history maps on to prophecy It's more just this is how it feels to be thrown into the midst of that. And I think that in that way, at least, the experience of reading those books is probably pretty similar to the experience of the original audience hearing the book of Revelation read aloud in the way that early churches would do. Mm, Um, Right. Now, of course, I think that uh, to me, the vision of the left behind books is kind of misplaced and is pretty different from Revelation, but at least in that form of visual imagery, I think there's something really compelling about that, and I think it made apocalyptic studies or the idea of the end times something that suddenly had a lot of urgency and kind of texture and compelling appeal for everyday people. Yeah, and and something else that you kind of discuss in your essay is kind of this, like... I don't know. The the left behind books really draw these like hard lines between like the good guys and the bad guys. And by the time like the second coming is coming, you just have good people on earth and evil people. And so this like clear dichotomy of like the chosen and the damned is pretty compelling, especially if you're reading it from the perspective of someone who presumably is chosen, you know? Yeah. And I think, Kind of historically, you have World War II and you have the Cold War and you have these other kind of historical good versus evil conflicts. And then like the 90s, or at least in the case of the Cold War, maybe a conflict that was less clearly good versus evil than World War II. But these conflicts um, and these kind of grand narratives, and then in the 90s, that kind of recedes and you don't have that anymore. And I think Mm -hmm. we all want to be part of an epic. And I think we all kind of want that grand narrative. And yeah, when there's an author on hand to make us not just in the grand narrative, but actually protagonists of the grand narrative and unambiguously righteous protagonists facing down evil, um, there's something really appealing about it. Yeah. Absolutely. As far as the actual book of Revelation, you know, there is a lot of like 
fire and brimstone and like seven headed creatures and all of the apocalyptic imagery is there. But can you maybe give listeners and you do in, in your essay too just a, a a better sense of like at least what scholarship today sort of thinks about like what revelation is is about, like what all that imagery is actually talking about? I would probably hesitate a little bit to give any kind of like common scholarly view on the kind of devastation in Revelation, because I do think it's just one of those passages of the Bible that's difficult for everyone really to wrap their head around. Um, But I think uh, one word that comes to mind is sort of um, dramatization, and I don't necessarily mean that like it's necessarily exaggerated or fictional, but dramatization like it's a drama, um, like a stage play. that there is this sort of escalating, um, almost kind of spiraling out of control sequence of bad things that are happening in judgment on history. And, I mean, I I certainly would, uh, personally at least, think that the first reaction to that would just be, like, (laughs) uh, judgment is coming. Mm -hmm. Um, And like punishment in some way, um, well, not punishment necessarily, but that judgment on the world is coming. I think that one way to view that, you know, to Revelation's audience, uh, that judgment would have been gracious because the um, most of the early Christians were the poor and the outcasts because, um, of course, those are the people who Jesus said would be the early Christians and the people who Christianity resonates the most with, and they were facing, um, a lot of them, a really hard time under the rule of the powers that be in the Eastern Mediterranean world of first century Rome. And I think for them, that judgment is a message of grace. It's a message of an oppressor being uh, cast down, um, being put off. But I I think, too, in some ways, it's a dramatization of um, the fact that every empire has to fall, um, that the human institutions that we put trust in are impermanent um, and fallible, and they will eventually um, all be destroyed. And I think part of what I try to do, in the essay at least, is to make that idea personal too um, Mm. that we kind of have our outer selves that are trying to you know cope with the world and manage and accumulate money and power and influence and stability and accomplishment and that all of these things will eventually fail us you know see it in people that were incredible athletes in high school, if they don't make it into college sports, then that's something that's a huge part of their life that's just not there for them anymore down the road. And so the jock who is oppressing the nerds in high school will have his fall. Um, Mm -hmm. His own sort of personal apocalypse. Yeah. And if he goes to college, he might not make the NFL. And if he makes the NFL, the might be all sorts of problems that can happen afterward. And even if somebody, you know, is perfect all through their life, they're eventually going to get old and have their body deteriorate and die. And so all of that is coming. And I think Revelation sort of expresses the fact that our engines of self-justification and self-elevation will all not just rust, but even be kind of violently smashed apart. And you say that the same thing is sort of happening in some of the imagery in the book of Daniel, too. Yeah, I think there is a sort of statue of the different empires that were crumbling over time. And the statue is so cool because it's empires at uh, four different parts of the statue are supposed to represent the four great empires. But at the same time, it's in the shape of a person. 
and as a whole, what the statue evokes isn't so much the idea of, you know, some abstract idea of empire, but a very concrete idea just of a single human's uh, mm. pride and vanity. Uh, it's like that poem, Ozymandias. And so I think that's one place where that sort of world historical and personal ideas get uh, tied together in a really pithy image. Mm. And Will, to like bring it home, you kind of talk about Proust and this image of his main character in early childhood. And it's such a powerful image of personally sort of growing up and learning to cope with the absence of this like original love that you had as a baby. But you connect that to what the apocalypse means. And can you just give folks a, just a little bit of a taste of what you're talking about there? Yeah, I think um, in... Uh Proust, the narrator, it starts with this kid who basically spends most of his nights just waiting for his mother to come up and kiss him goodnight, because <laughs> um, that is the one moment of his day where he feels really sort of connected to another person and where he really feels like an object of their love, um, and he didn't have a bad family life or anything like that, I think he's just kind of an unusually sensitive person, um, or at least a person whose sensitivity is unusually close to the surface. We can't relate and, uh, to that at all, can we? <laughs> no, no, certainly <laughs> not, Ethan. Um, but, uh, yeah, and he tries so many things. I mean, he sexually obsesses over several women throughout the course of the novels. He obsesses over status climbing. Um, he's just kind of seeking uh, love and value and a place in the world. And one really poignant scene that I liked a lot from that book was when he uh, goes off, I think it's in the second book, to the beach. Um, and he is staying in a hotel room by himself. And um, his grandmother's in the hotel room next door and is he's wanted to go to the beach i think because there's a i think it's girls i think he kind of falls in love with a group of four or five girls who kind of coyly ride their bicycles around all day as they do fascinate them yeah and his family springs to put him in his ho this hotel it's kind of a luxury but they love him enough to accommodate his desire to go spend a month down there and he just can't the, the first summer um, that he gets those rooms, he just almost can't leave his room. He's so debilitated by the depression of being away from his parents and kind of alone and, and having to sleep by himself. You know, he's gone out to search something that'll make him feel valuable. And in the process, he's he's left behind a lot of his family, except his grandmother, who travels with him. And one cool thing about the narrator of that book is he doesn't need that moment of judgment, really. The judgment is kind of always there. He's never anything but a, like, poor, kind of helpless, desperate for love kid. We don't see any kind of the violent snatching things away or destruction of accomplishments that we see in Revelation because he doesn't really have anything like that. And in some ways, his his kind of suffering is all just that need that he can't find an object to satisfy. And um, I talk about in the essay this incredible kind of scene of both independence and separation, but also kind of togetherness and love when he's in an adjoining room with his grandmother. And when he gets so lonely that he just can't bear it anymore, they have a signal and I don't think they ever talk about it or plan it or set it up. It's just something that develops or they don't talk about it over breakfast the next day. It's just something that develops organically between the two of them where he will knock a certain pattern of knocks on the wall and she will knock back to let him know, um, I am here for you. I'm here if you need me. Um, I, I will come and comfort you. And I think to me that's that idea of a, the wall kind of being both a barrier and a link is 
really interesting. And it's, mm. it's like on earth, you know, we are separated from God. He's not in the room with us, but we're also together with him. We get these promises. You know, if you have a high view of the sacraments, uh, communion is one of the main ways that God knocks at the door or through worship um, or reading the Bible. And we can hear that knocking, you know, saying, um, I may not be there, but I'm for you and I'm going to come back to you and be with you. Or like experiences of the Holy Spirit, you know, just having a inspired moment, you know, where you, you feel the presence of something. You talk about that too. Yeah. And that's a really, I mean, that's a really powerful example. And I think a place where, you know, when I was, to be honest, for whatever reason, I got more of that when I was in high school than I have mm -hmm. <laughs> since then and, and in college. But uh, maybe that's something that comes a little more easily to younger people. But at the time, I remember just thinking that that's how things should be all the time, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, rather than taking it like a knock and a signal and saying, okay, I can remember that experience. I can remember yeah. that as God being there. I, maybe this is stretching it too far, but you, you have the, the wall there and the door, and he can trust that she's there just by hearing the knock. And, um, you know, the knock for us is the promise that we're given in Christ. And you also say that the meaning for apocalypsis is like this unveiling, this idea of something being like revealed or, or stripped away. And um, maybe it's like two different things at once. You know, one is like the stripping away of, of all the ways that we've tried to cope with not being in the presence of that love, not being in the same room. So making money. Uh, chasing success, finding the perfect love, all these things that we do to sort of fill the void or make use of our time, you know, all of that gets sort of, if not stripped away, just sort of made known for what it is. And that's kind of the judgment aspect. But is it also that the unveiling is that Christ is unveiled, you know, the, the wall is removed and there's no more knocking. It's just the presence of what we were longing for anyways. I mean, I guess what I'm wondering is what does this understanding do for you? Like, especially in hard times or in times where it's been a long time since you had a knock and you feel the absence more than you do the presence. What about this is helpful to you? One thing that's helpful to me, that's a old saying that you don't hear a lot now that uh, Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. Um, thinking about like a title of the title of Jesus being the Lord of history. And I think the idea that our timeline will ultimately be God's timeline, because that's another idea that I think gets really lost in some of the left behind stuff is it's like, you know, we all get raptured up to heaven while the earth kind of crumbles away to dust, and I think the biblical vision is kind of the historical vision that a lot of people now are starting to recover is one of the new Jerusalem coming down to earth and God coming to dwell with us. And what I really love about Revelation is that like human history isn't just some set of kind of arbitrary events that individuals with enough faith can be saved from but something that will actually be kind of saved in, um, mm. that God will intervene in human history and ultimately sort of shape human history and that God's dwelling will be on earth with us. Um, and to me, it's almost like an extension of the incarnation. You know, it's, there's a powerful sense of getting to be with God one day um, that I feel like we can get when we think about, you know, going up to heaven or going to be with God, but I think God coming to be with us, it's like we're already living in the place that we'll live with God, you know, mm -hmm. it's like living in the house where you're going to live with your wife um, while you're engaged or something, um, mm -hmm. and she's still living somewhere else, and but you're there, and you're starting to sort of see what your life there will look like, and you have this hope that is centered on the place that you're in. 
Mm. Um, and something about that kind of physicality and having the God with us um, already being in the place where that's going to be is one really cool source of comfort uh, to me from Revelation. I, I think one of the things that you touch on is this idea of like we have this reluctance about the sort of left behind way of like the apocalypse happening. And and part of that is because it's so alienating from the life that we have now. And it also just takes for granted that we want this like, you know, radical uprooting of our lives. There's a lot of things about our lives that, that we like, you know, um, you mentioned, like you just got married and you just started work as a lawyer. And so you've got a future ahead of you. And as we think about the future and, and what the future means in Christian terms, we have a reluctance about sort of the eschatology. And you, you talk about that being understandable. So I'm going to read this and then um, we'll close. But our reluctance is understandable. We want to hold on to the things that shape and define our secondary selves. The emperors of Rome wanted to hang on to their power and dominion. Revelation speaks of a world where God will intervene and strip it away to free his people. Even the oppressors have their own oppressors, power, wealth, popularity, those Proustian phantoms that promise life but prove death to us. The end of the phantoms is the beginning of freedom. We are reduced completely to our human sources of comfort. Reduced, the word itself means led back to our inner children those whom God will free and God will love. As John in Revelation put it, see the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And then you finish by saying at the end of every knock, God's presence by God's grace for God's children.